dear manager Neil Rowntree were in government, and some say he should be, his trip to New Zealand would be a special ministerial envoy, a fact-finding mission. That's because he's looking for inspiration, answers and ideas on how to maximise the natural resource inhabiting the landscape around him back home in Scotland, the Red Deer. Hunting, venison, tourism, trophies all pay their way and inject money into remote rural areas. In New Zealand, it's the same but different. Some ideas are modern and exciting. Others make Neil scratch his head. For example, he's been told there is no market for hunting red hinds or fallow does. In Arden America, and that's part of his bread and butter. What I've learned in a few days, and we've heard and had one or two interesting discussions, that there are technically elements of deer management here that they are undoubtedly leading the world on. Uh, and their genetics and their deer farming are spectacular. And then we found a backdrop here today where there really is, in this area, we're in a huge fallow deer population. If it was at home, if it was in the UK, it would present huge stocking opportunities, it would present huge meat marketing opportunities. But for the marketplace that they are in, we were talking to them saying about do, do you groups of guys coming here wanting to stock fallow does? And the simple answer we got surprised us both, which was no. So when they do it here, the only way they can do it is to do it as an operation of scale. And we saw earlier today them, them shooting quite a lot of deer and shipping them away quickly to be processed. And, and to my mind, and I mean I'm, I'm not a Kiwi and I can be corrected for it, it seems that there's, there's, there's similar issues to we have at home where there's legislation and there's opinion and it, it doesn't necessarily marry with practically using natural resources. The cultural differences may be, in part, due to New Zealand's relatively young and challenging relationship with deer. It wasn't that long ago they were an environmental disaster. But instead of mass destruction, some creative thinking gave birth to a global industry. Pest infestation turned into profit. This morning, our host, Duncan Fraser from Vanatal Cardrona Safaris, is going to show Neil some of his better bred pests. They have become part of the family of silver and gold and platinum. The Scottish introductions took us to a certain level. Yeah. And then what really kicked us to a next level was, you know, some of these uh, more multi-pointed genes that come out of the, Euro of the English parks out of Warnham, Woburn, Fursland. Yeah. Um, and then kind of the mixing and blending of all these different genetic strains from Eastern Europe, from Yugoslavia, from Austria, from Romania, crossed with the English deer. It was kind of like taking the best of both all these different worlds and mixing them in, uh -huh. making a milkshake and yeah. coming out with the, uh, with the, the, the end result. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly it's always been the way I, I've believed it. I mean, red deer in, in, in the UK and in the Scottish Highlands are probably at the northern extremity of their range as a species. Yeah. So exactly. it's, it's nutrition and shelter that's really re reduced their ability to demonstrate their genetic ability. Well, it's the same thing, you know, we talked about a lot when we come out to the, to the, uh, to the west coast where you are and, and look at the yeah. deer and they are, they're a lot smaller in the body than what we're used to. Uh -huh. But, like you said, that's a, an environment that's driven that because for a smaller body it takes less food, it's less, uh, less heat to keep them warm during the winter. You know, there's a whole lot of reason that's driven them to, to uh, be a smaller bodied animal. If yeah. they were a big Eastern European deer in that environment they wouldn't last five seconds. Yeah. So, so Duncan, for a comparison here, we're just uh, holding two different heads up, one behind the other, so people can get an idea of what you were talking about. Yeah. Talk us through this guy a little bit. So this is probably more traditional of uh, some of our uh, Warnham Park genetics but probably kind of looks very similar to some of the uh, East Bloc kind of deer, some, you know, Hungary, yeah. probably more Hungary than Romania, but some of those sort of uh, countries where you'll get kind of wide, sweeping antlers, long, clean p crowns, um, not necessarily huge, huge mass, but just really, really pretty stags. Yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, it's a big, bigger example than I've ever seen of them, but I have seen this type of genetics in, in parks in the UK, so I'm, I'm right in seeing similarity there. Yeah, definitely. And the, the, he is distinctly different to the guy in front of him. Very different. Yeah, you can see this one, he's got a lot more mass, not as long in the main beam, and, and more cuppy in the crown. Not yep. quite as open style as what this head is. So, you know, I mean, definitely uh, different genetics, uh, different traits at different parks. Neil couldn't come all this way without hunting his own New Zealand red stag.
the chances are it will be the biggest he has ever shot. We drive to a private estate, we not public land, and it's very beautiful. Well, it's been something I've always wanted to do in a country that has fascinated me. The whole story of Red Deer and how they came to New Zealand. And uh, I feel almost like a kid today. It's almost, <laughs> it's almost like a dream come true. So I'm quite excited with the whole thing. Do you find it odd being guided, or is that something you, you're used to? I think uh, these days I'm quite, I wouldn't say I'm used to it, but it, it's interesting. Different folks, different strokes, you know. And uh, I think as you get older, you, you get wiser to the fact that people can always teach you something. And it's their landscape, and uh, the Kiwis know their way around this land. So, no, I'm actually I'm probably better off being with them than being on my own. So, no, I'm, I'm quite <laughs> relaxed. Me too. Yeah, yeah. I'm really looking forward to it. And I mean, the landscape, I mean, uh, you've seen it yourself. I mean, the landscape's incredible. Joining our hunting is Neil's Belgian friend, Laurent Huart. Laurent runs Magic Safari Lodges, a wonderful resource for hunting around the world. And he works closely with the likes of West Highland Hunting and Venator Cardrona Safaris. And what I always try to do is, is to put different outfitters um, together so that they start knowing each other. They share by the end the same type of clients and having an outfitter recommend another place anywhere around the world uh, coming from a professional well, it makes more uh, it's more credible than than just picking up a brochure at a show or anything else i would say so it's important but being here and 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 discovering i would say uh, an operation like this uh, gives it for me anyway even more credit because I can talk about it. I mean, people often ask me about these different lodges. Unfortunately, I can't answer of all of them. Um, but when I can, well, it makes a huge difference because you have experienced it. It's, yeah, it's, it's really great, I would say. Back to the hunt, and the stag they have in mind for him has evaded the crosshairs for two seasons. Marcus thinks it will be a challenge, even for Neil. The terrain is not unlike home turf, which is why he's decided to wear his usual nomad clothing. The thing that appeals to me about nomad clothing is, uh, particularly in a highland setting, and today we're not in a highland setting, it, it has a traditional look, which means for both me and my guys, it, it looks very traditional to what Highland gamekeepers and deer stalkers wore. I think importantly, and even here in New Zealand, it's it's borne itself out that it's effective camouflage. And I think more importantly than any of these things for us is that our guys are guiding for over 30 weeks a year, and uh, it's hard to say on a sunny day like this, but very often we're out in atrocious weather conditions. And the fact that you've got a garment that's warm, it's comfortable, you can move around in it easily, and it keeps you dry. Makes, uh, makes a huge difference. After a couple of hours, we find our boy. He is huge, and Neil has to try and compose himself on some slippery and steep terrain. I saw Marcus clock him, and then I clocked him, and then he turned and just started drifting down the brae. And I thought when he stood in that gap there, that was his one and only look at you before he buggered off. That is, I, I'm, uh, we'll go and have a good look at the moment, but uh, that's big yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's the biggest dog I've shot. I've travelled halfway around the world to do it. But it's just a hell of an experience. I'm almost emotional, David. Oh, well done, sir. Thank you very much, Marcus. Wow, what an incredible stag, it's a big stag, it's going to be interesting watching David drag that out of there isn't it, beautiful, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 
8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, I'm going to it's, it's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, it, the, the New Zealanders, there's a lot of people who have ideas, and we've talked about it earlier today, that uh, deer in New Zealand, that they inject them with hormones and do all sorts of odd things to them. But the vegetation you've looked at today gives you an idea of how good the grazing is. And, and Scottish deer that were brought here in the 1870s, you know, within a couple of generations, they'd, they'd trebled in size. And what the New Zealanders have done, and in, uh, where we are here at Cadrona, they've uh, taken understanding and applying deer genetics to a level far ahead of anything we've done in the UK. And, and the stag that you're looking at over my shoulder, by what they've managed to breed and, and deliver through selective breeding, that's a small one. He wasn't going fast. When we look at the shot there, there Marcus, I mean, it's, to my mind it's in a fairly good spot. I, I was surprised that, uh, that he took it and moved it as, as well, as strongly. And, it, and obviously these, these big solid stags, they, they can take a fair bit of oomph. A couple of hundred kilograms, but you know, you hit him perfect right on behind the shoulder. You'd only gone 10 or 15 yards, and that was it. We just couldn't see where he was lying in, in amongst this thick cover from where we were. Just now. I'm more inclined to want to carry the stag's head than the whole stag, that's what you are. There's no ticks on the either, is there? Oh, that's fine. Although this animal will enter the food chain, albeit via a helicopter extraction, most hunters come here for the head, however unfashionable that may be in some quarters. It's all right when your guide tells you it's only a couple of hundred yards and it's about half a mile. Glad to put the damn thing down now. <laughs> Trophy hunting is alive, well and lucrative, so should we be worried? No. What is a trophy anyway? Some trophies are free but have great meaning. A first rabbit, a beautiful fox, a photo of you and your first pheasant. It's a trophy, something like a memento or a souvenir. Others in this world are not free. The important thing is that the New Zealanders are utilising a natural resource to the max. Neil understands about being at the sharp end of making a natural resource pay its way. And given the current climate, our special envoy has to be as creative as possible to make sure his deer pay. Their future depends on it.